Hare Krishna. So I'll speak today on the topic of how our emotions can take us towards Krishna and not away from Krishna. I'll speak based on Bhagavad Gita uh, 252 and 53. Krishna says, once we become fixed in spirituality, then our worldly perceptions and the emotions associated with them will not take us away from him. But rather will take us, will become more and more absorbed in him. So I'll speak this based on five D's or rather five D-N. So dissatisfaction is something which we all experience in life. So dissatisfaction can lead to delusion and degradation. Or dissatisfaction can be seen with discrimination, with intelligence and then that can lead to devotion. So these two parts we'll talk about and then We'll talk about how we can choose the right path. So let's begin first with dissatisfaction or discomfort is something we all experience in life. Now discomfort may come because of loneliness. Discomfort may come because of stress. It may come because of overwork. It may come because of anger. It may come because of poor health. Discomfort is something which everyone experiences in life. And when the discomfort comes, say right now also, maybe sitting on the floor may be uncomfortable for some of you. Hmm? There are some spaces here. <laughs> yeah, please sit if you want. <laughs> hmm? There are also spaces there, wherever you want. So, now sometimes dis when un discomfort is there, we try to avoid the discomfort. Hmm? Sometimes avoiding the discomfort makes us go towards certain default course of actions. All of us over the years have evolved our own ways of dealing with discomfort. <clears throat> Recently I was in America and Connecticut so I was asked to speak at a conference on spirituality and addiction. And there are different people presented, I also presented. So, what the theme we spoke on over there is that often people think of addiction, or at least many people earlier thought of it as whether drug addiction or alcoholism or whatever. It's as a person not having adequate willpower, a person not having adequate intelligence. That's possible, but that's not the only thing. It's basically a person not having a healthy response to discomforts of life. So a, a basic level of discomfort all of us may experience is boredom. We all get bored with life. The survey done in Europe and America about the average emotional states of people who are reasonably well-to-do and healthy. There's 5% of the time people are happy. 5% of the time people are unhappy. 90% of the time they are bored. <laughs> So, the entertainment industry is primarily thriving on people's boredom. So, it's a, you could say the anti-boredom industry or you could call it the boredom industry itself. So the point is that <clears throat> all of us feel discomfort in different ways. And for some people, from discomfort to delusion becomes like a rapid path. Delusion means, say if somebody has uh, taken, uh, abused alcohol, once or twice they drunk a lot, and although they've got the consequences, the hangover or whatever, but <clears throat> what happens afterwards, later on the mind only remembers, oh I went high. The mind doesn't remember how low I went afterwards. So what happens next time when they feel uncomfortable, they immediately gravitate towards alcohols. Or nowadays there's net surfing. Yeah, we can just spend hours and hours just surfing this and surfing that and surfing that and people can just spend their whole life like that. 
So now when we feel bored, we want something to stimulate us, then we just surf on the net and read this, watch this, do this. And then gradually that becomes like a default response for us. So as soon as dissatisfaction or discomfort comes, from discomfort immediately we move towards what do you, delusion. Delusion means we think this will relieve me. Now any kind of indulgence like this, so it may be smoking, it may be drinking, it may be binge eating, it may be binge TV watching, binge net surfing, whatever. So now it gives us a temporary feeling of high. But afterwards, we feel lower than before. So that's why it's a delusion. As I said, what is the delusion? We remember later only the high, but we forget the low. That is uh, uh, the that is the delusion. So even when people after alcohol and they get a hangover, but the hangover doesn't hang over for very long. It stays for a few hours, and after that, what really hangs over, what it stays with them is, oh, I went high. So over a period of time, people gravitate almost unconsciously from dissatisfaction to delusion. And then from delusion, the next step is degradation. So when somebody gets deluded and gets compulsively into some habit, then they start squandering their money on it. They started wasting their time disproportionately on it. They may even spoil their relationships for it. They may sacrifice their ethics. So, in general, <clears throat> there's, a, there's a person from the Connecticut Police Department also who's one of the top officers. He spoke that, in general, if a person commits a crime, what we see is what, not just the person that commits a crime, but what is the person's overall life. If somebody is, a, is an addict, then that is almost a 100% guarantor that that person is going to repeatedly commit crime. Because that addiction has distorted the priorities. And now to get that addictive substance, anything and everything will be done. So basically, when all of us face discomfort, we come up with some responses, some ways to deal with the discomfort. And if that way is unhealthy, it leads to delusion. And once that delusion captivates us, then we go down to degradation. Now, Krishna talks about this in 2.62 in the Bhagavad Gita and 63 it says, When we contemplate on the sense objects, He says that the whole sequence goes on. Krodhat bhavati sammoha sammoha smati vibrama smati brahmashat buddhinasha buddhinashat pranashati So how it is? Dhyayato. Oh, just look at it. Think about it. And then after that, you can imagine a snowball. I had gone to Canada. I was speaking in Calgary. I was in university. It's high up. So we are going up the mountain with a curving road. And then we saw while we were coming down, like a small snowball rolling down. And the snowball when it was on top, you could just have kicked it with a toe and it would have cracked apart. At that time, it's not even a snowball. It's a snow pebble. Hmm? But as it starts coming down, coming down, coming down, coming down, it gains mass and it gains momentum. And then, by the time it has come down, it is not even a snowball, it's a snow boulder. <laughs> and then, what the same person who got kicked it away, that same person will get completely crushed by that. So you could see actually snowballs coming down, the snowball is so, it's a pebble over here, it's like a ball over here, it's become a boulder over here, they're all coming down like that. So, now, Similarly, when it is on top, dhyayato vishayan comes. Hey, just look at something, we think about something. And then sangaste shupa jayate. Hey, that's nice. So attachment, that's nice. Then sangat sanjayate kamaha. I want it. Kama is strong desire. Then kamat krodho vijayate. So who says I can't get it? Anger. Anger at whatever is restraining us, who says I can't get it? Krodhad bhavati sammoha. Sammoha is delusion. What I said just now? So, delusion. We forget that this has some consequences which are not wanted. Sammoha smuti vibrama. Then, our own memory of the past consequences gets wiped out. 
सो एज सून एज वी परस्यू सम सेंस परस्यू सम सेंशुअल प्लेजर इट्स लाइक इन अ कंप्यूटर द एफ टू बटन डिलीट एवरीथिंग इज डिलीट देन स्मृति भ्रमशाद बुद्धिनाशो मच ऑफ आर इंटेलिजेंस इज सेंटर्ड ऑन आवर मेमोरी इफ यू रिमेंबर देन वी कैन एक्ट इंटेलिजेंटली इफ यू फॉरगेट यू कॉन्ट एक्ट इंटेलिजेंटली I was in <coughs> Portland, and there one of the most Portlanders in um, America. So there, one of the uh, very prominent surgeons over there, uh, he had come there, and somehow he had got a brain stroke. And although he had recovered motor faculty, uh, he could move about, but his memory had got wiped out. And the same surgeon, but now. He couldn't even remember how to operate a scalpel properly. So you know, our intelligence is based on our memory. If our memory is lost, then intelligence is lost. The same principle applies to uh, spiritual life also. If we forget scripture, if we forget what we have learned from the saintly people, from our spiritual guides, then our intelligence is lost. and then what happens buddhinashat pranashyati we succumb to degradation pranashyati so now here krishna is talking about from contemplation to delusion to degradation hmm? now i am talking about something else i talked about dissatisfaction the first thing. why would we contemplate on something in the first place it might just be in our radar radar but still we contemplate on it because what we are doing is not very satisfying Say a student is studying on the computer, doing some work, some assignment, and in India they have a joke: an assignment makes you an ass. You know, assignment makes you an ass. So it's like oh, so much work to do. You get bored by the work, and then when they get bored by the work, I want a break. Discomfort is there, and what? Okay, let me surf on some sites. Let me read something, watch something. Some news, some sports, some movie, and there's so many other degraded things over there. But then, what happens by that? From that, the contemplation begins, and then it's like the so from contemplation to degradation to delusion. That's like the snowball, snow pebble growing bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So this is how our emotions, if they're not processed properly, they can drag us down. Our emotions can delude us. So from dissatisfaction. Through delusion, from dissatisfaction to contemplation, and that's all sequence: delusion and ultimately degradation. So it's not so much a lack of willpower that could be there. It's not even a lack of intelligence. It could, that could also be there, but it's more a lack of awareness of how we gravitate towards an unhealthy response. If we don't know how to deal with this discomfort in a healthy way, we just like on autopilot gravitate towards. the unhealthy response and say somebody makes a resolution from tomorrow i am going to be a new me i am going to give this up i am never going to do it again now oscar wilde was a <clears throat> british author he said giving up smoking is the easiest thing in the whole world i have done it over 100 times <laughs> so he gave up smoking but smoking didn't give him up so what happens we make a resolution i am going to give this up and i am going to be a new me and then with iron will power there's a new me for 2 3 4 days <laughs> and then when the new me just stops looking immediately the old me comes back and we revert to what we were earlier so this is how dissatisfaction leads to delusion and degradation this is the first point i was going to talk so any reflections or any comments about this any how thoughts we, how can we be aware of about the emotions no not dumb questions Questions will be at the end. <laughs> any any point from this which uh, spoke to you, which struck you, which you felt was something which you could relate with or you could carry home. We'll have time for questions later. Yeah. Generally, what happens is like after the whole day of work, that you know, <coughs> even by traveling and coming mm. back home. Generally, uh, after you know, when we come home and we get so tired, at that time. Now, I think that's I've experienced that. Okay, now let me give some time. I will watch some uh, movie or something else, like you know, just 
to entertain my mind, just to relax myself or something like mm. that. But then what happened is like, no, like I have to read something because I didn't get a chance to read like at least half an hour or whatever. So I can see, I can see that every, most of the time when I get so tired or something, my mind generally goes towards something else rather than towards spiritual things. And it goes to somewhere else like, okay, mm. let me do, I would like, because I also watch cricket more. So I would, what's the score or what? what's going on right now in the sports or something else. Mm, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Actually, one way we feel discomfort, unco- discomfort is also tiredness. It could be physical tiredness, it could also be me- mental tiredness. I just need a break now. So, now, <clears throat> sometimes, some break can also lead to a breakthrough. But sometimes some break can lead to a breakdown. So we have to be careful what kind of break we take. <laughs> yeah. Any other reflections about this? I think we were going back to Amishpur's uh, uh, reflection. Uh, you know, I think I also get caught up with that. And uh, what I actually, uh, I think, uh, try to make myself understand is that like because of this effect of, uh, you know, you could say Facebook, YouTube, because there is always instant gratification available. Mm. And the fact is that because there is instant gratification available, the mind doesn't want to let you think much. And so, as said, once you get into that impulse, you get mm. like an impulsive, everything else, like then everything becomes like a box. Okay, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, mm. I'm going to do this. And then in, in between, like, you know, I see. On the other day, I was just say, seeing that uh, I was uh, driving and I was at the light, traffic light. <coughs> and my the car on my right hand side, car on my left hand side, the drivers, their uh, you know their shoulders down because they're on their on their phone because they could do something quick and they feel more uh, I don't know more achievement in that sense. Whereas I feel that it actually you know it's it's more on the basis of impulse. That they're doing something but actually not getting the results. Mm. I mean, this is, yeah, that's I was true. just thinking in that sense. Yeah, I think devices can be used carefully and they can be very powerful if they're used po- properly. But you know, there's only D between device and vice. <laughs> <laughs> and that D is a D of discrimination, which I'll talk about. So if you're not discriminating in the use of devices, they can drag us down very easily. So, yeah, all of us have certain default responses. And if you can observe them, then we can monitor them. Some people just think, I'm doing so much work. I'm doing this, this, this. If you're doing work, that is good. But how much of it is actually necessary work and how much of it is self-created work? <laughs> self-created work means sometimes you know you, you get a message and you instantly send a message back and then a small issue, we spend maybe minutes, uh, several minutes and hours on it. So there's no need for that. <laughs> so sometimes you just send a message, okay, gradually send a message back and things get dealt with. So it, it could be that sometimes, as I said, we can't make a blanket statement that those who are using devices are hooked to it or, but it, we have to be ourselves have a discrimination. Am I using it constructively or is it using me? Is it consuming me? Yeah. Thank you. So, so that was the first point that if we don't process discomfort and dissatisfaction properly, then they lead to delusion and what? Degradation. So now the alternative course is from dissatisfaction or discomfort, we move through discrimination towards devotion. Now the word discrimination today has a negative connotation like say gender discrimination or racial discrimination or religious discrimination or whatever. But discrimination in the dictionary itself has two meanings. So I, I once wrote an article, don't discriminate against discrimination. <laughs> 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 the word discrimination has a philosophical sense or an intellectual sense where you, know, you, you make distinctions. The capacity to pursue subtle distinctions. So that is the discriminating capacity. And that is very much required. If anybody is to be a sharp observer of things, somebody for somebody who doesn't know music, anybody who plays music, it's good. But somebody who's really good at music, somebody who's playing kartaze, you know, 
not very not very well some beats are going off so those who are discriminating they can notice that so discrimination is the capacity to pursue fine distinctions and that is a necessary faculty in fact expertise in any field gives us a deepened capacity for discrimination uh, so what does discrimination mean over here so when we face dissatisfaction the first thing to understand is that discomfort is itself neither unnatural nor unhealthy it's just the natural way of being in the world everybody feels discomfort and uh, discomfort sometime or the other so in a sense we need to become comfortable with feeling uncomfortable would i mean by this statement we need to <coughs> comfortable means it's not okay i'm feeling bored okay feeling bored is not like a earth shattering event it is a common thing which happens to everyone so it's not that just because i am bored i have to get rid of the boredom at all costs see when we think something is unnatural and unhealthy it's tiredness if i think it is unnatural if i think it is unhealthy then i will want to get rid of it at any cost but if i understand this is just natural just a part of being a part of life is we all will go through different emotions sometimes every one of us will feel lonely somebody might be physically alone and they might feel lonely but actually the the greatest loneliness we feel is when we are around people who don't understand us that is the most crippling kind of loneliness so <clears throat> if people misunderstand us judge us then we feel as if we are starved of emotional oxygen understanding is to the heart what oxygen is to the body so we all feel lonely at times <clears throat> and when we feel lonely uh, it's of course it's not at the very word it's, it's uncomfortable feeling but it's not a unnatural feeling everybody feels lonely at times so to become comfortable with being uncomfortable means to recognize that okay this happens and the key thing over here is these feelings they don't last for very long when we are feeling bored when we are feeling lonely when we are feeling tired when we are feeling stressed when we are feeling overwhelmed these feelings are there they don't last for very long we just need to outlast them so this is and discrimination i want to talk about three things that first is that discomfort is not unnatural it it happens to everyone <coughs> the second is that discomfort is temporary it won't last forever we just need to outlast it how many times <clears throat> when say somebody is feeling bored and they think let me take one drink he said that first the drinker takes a drink then the drink takes a drink then the drink takes the drinker <laughs> <laughs> so that's how the person gets lost so now at that time okay i'm feeling bad i'm feeling bored i'm feeling low but it's a part of life it's just like in um, we have environmental weather sometimes it's hot sometimes it's cold now sometimes we feel cold very uncomfortable sometimes we feel heat very uncomfortable but it comes and it goes so like that emotions like these also come and they go in the 14th chapter of the bhagavad gita text 22 to 25 krishna says just become a observer of your emotions this is discrimination prakasham cha pravrittim cha moham eva cha pandava na dveshti sam pravrittani na nivrittani kaanshati udasi na vadasinam gunayyo na vichalyate ಗುಣಾವರ್ತಂತಿ 
we don't have to over react to it so it will come it will stay for some time it will go away so to do this we have to see that this emotions are <clears throat> they are visitors in our consciousness they'll stay for some time and they will go but the word krishna uses is udasina vad udasina vad asina what is like is like as if detached he's not saying be entirely detached because those are emotions coming in us so in english there are two words disinterested and uninterested if you read any english book on commonly confused words hmm? these two words are confused by people sometimes even dictionaries get confused <laughs> and they, not all dictionaries so does anyone know the difference between these two words disinterested and uninterested anyone you're not interested in guessing also <laughs> <laughs> so uninterested is having no interest is don't care for it disinterested is having no vested interests it is having no agenda disinterest it is impartial so say if there is a umpire in a cricket match hmm? now say the bowler bowls a ball and the ball goes and hits the leg of the uh, batsman and all the players appear and they turn to the umpire and the umpire says i was not watching the match it's what <laughs> what are you doing <laughs> what are you here for i am not interested in the match what and why be umpire <laughs> an umpire cannot be uninterested. uninterested but umpire should be disinterested the umpire shouldn't be that umpire shouldn't want one team to win <laughs> so even if the batsman is out the umpire says no not out <laughs> what is not out so the umpire shouldn't be biased towards the particular team so the umpire should be disinterested not uninterested so that similarly <clears throat> we also with respect to our emotions have to become like that udasin vat be as if detached so each emotion that comes within us it's like a player appealing hey i am bored i am angry i am lonely so now now just because a player is appealing doesn't mean the default response umpire raises his hand out <laughs> no the umpire has to use once discrimination intelligence is that really out is it not out so like that the mind says oh i am bored come on let's watch let's watch this let's drink this let's do this so the mind is appealing the emotions are appealing so no discrimination should i do that should i not do it so when we develop this capacity for discrimination then we will rasa detect okay if i go in that direction that will lead to delusion that will lead to degradation so i don't need to go in that direction so this capacity for discrimination is developed by our intelligence is developed by our study of the bhagavad gita by our associating with devotees and understanding the philosophy of krishna bhakti when this discrimination is developed then we can catch ourselves when we start gravitating towards the unhealthy response so sometimes an unhealthy response comes up even without thinking it's like we go on autopilot i feel bored okay let me just go and do that let me just watch this do that do that so but if we are have the discrimination then even before we start going on the autopilot we shake it off this what is happening so at that time now so the first part of discrimination is recognizing that discomfort is natural it is not unnatural and unhealthy second is <coughs> second part of discrimination is just becoming a disinterested observer of the emotions and evaluating them on merit the third part of discrimination is developing a healthy response so <clears throat> for all of us we all uh, have various interests there is something good within us there is something bad within us and we need to work on our bad work on the bad that's inside us but we need to work with the good that's inside us so work with the good means say somebody has interest in music 
then uh, if they have a default response towards maybe drinking or excessive tv watching or device addiction now for them if you just say don't do this that's going to be very difficult that will create a sense of deprivation but if they like music and they decide you know okay i'll keep some music with me either i'll hear the music or i'll play the music myself and keep that as easily accessible as possible so then when that bored that discomfort comes we can choose that response at that time we need a response that also activates our emotional energy see even emotion is pitted against reason it's almost always emotion will be it's very very difficult that in the battle again between emotion and reason emotion means this feels good reason says that's bad i don't care how it is i feels good i want to do it so if there's a battle between emotion and reason almost always emotion will win so what we need to do is we need to make emotion an ally of reason not just the adversary of reason now how do we make emotion an ally of the reason by finding out some good activity which also feels good to us so if somebody say if somebody is feeling bored and they are getting tempted towards something and you tell them okay now read bhagavad gita <laughs> if somebody is philosophical they will love it But for others hey what now <laughs> they can't do it so we have to find out we have to make emotion our ally when we make emotion our ally then what happens then that emotional energy even if it is small maybe the emotional energy going this way will be strong towards delusion degradation but this way the emotional energy even if it is small at least some emotion is there on this side and then it becomes easier to resist that so each of us can take inventory to find out the what are the good things that we can use to break the cycle of degradation what are the good things that we also feel good about and when we keep that as a resource for us then that helps us counter dissatisfaction in a healthier way the bhakti rasamrut sindhu is a whole book about emotions and how about how to develop pure devotional emotions for the lord and an advanced book of bhakti rasamrut sindhu is ujjwal nilamani ujjwal nilamani talks about very deep and exalted emotions of love for krishna and there rupa goswami uses a word called uddipan uddipan is spiritual stimulus just as all of us may have sensual stimulus say an alcoholic sees a bottle of alcohol and that is the stimulus that drags them towards alcohol so i saw once a picture of a person is in front of a computer and the person is trying to try to turn away but from the computer like tentacles or arms are coming out and catching that person pulling them towards the computer so it's like that so we all have certain sensual stimuli which pull us in that direction but we can find out what are the devo- devotional stimuli that pull us towards krishna as i said some for some, for some people it might be kirtan for some people it might be the deities just have a picture of the deities think of dressing the deities decorating the deities just beholding their beauty for some people it might be verses just recite verses is if you have this traditional recitation of sanskrit verses it can be very mellifluous and very uplifting so we find out so the devotional stimulus that works for us and when we do that then what will happen the discrimination will take us towards devotion and that's the healthier trajectory this is the second point i made that <clears throat> when we feel dissatisfaction we use our discrimination to understand that dissatisfaction is not unnatural or unhealthy that dissatisfaction won't last i just need to outlast it so i become a disinterested or uninterested observer and on merit i respond to the appeal of that emotion and if i can make emotion my ally and find out some spiritual stimulus or some higher stimulus that takes my consciousness towards krishna Uh, towards something constructive then i can move from dissatisfaction through discrimination towards devotion 
So any comments or any reflections on this? Is it too complicated? <laughs> Is it too personal to reflect on? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I had a practical example where exactly the same thing you said. So when I was at university and I was studying, I would sometimes go to the library to study and then after studying for some period of time you'd get bored. Mm -hmm. And then you look to your friends and they were just as bored. So then you just start talking and there goes the whole day. So then I start thought, okay, you know, if you need to get work done, you should probably stay at home and do it. And then when you get bored, I have my instruments right next to me. So I thought, okay, let's learn some bhajan. And then you learn a bhajan in like five or ten minutes. And then you're like, okay, that's good enough. That was enough. Like Beautiful. engaging your mind in something. And then you go back to study. So it was good. Like it was a practical example of exactly mm. the same thing you said. Yeah, it's very nice. Thank you. I also found that I write articles and maybe I write articles on contemporary affairs. I speak on contemporary affairs also. So you need to be in touch with the world. So I, I used to, I read news and I don't like to read news itself. I like to read analysis of news because that analysis helps me to <clears throat> make some analysis. But then <clears throat> what happens is that nowadays, if you just go to Google News, one event, there'll be like 50 reports of that. And then you can just spend so much time in that. So about a, a few months ago, I did an analysis. How much time I have spent on reading and how much content did I get for speaking? So I found it, as, if I spend that much time in studying scripture, I can get far more content for sharing and I can use my creativity. I don't necessarily have to read news. So now what I did was, so, but over a period of time, that had also become like a default response. When you get some time, just look, look for news. And then what happens is, if you want to read news and, and for analysis purposes, you need to, your intelligence needs to be strong. If you are bored at that time and then you are reading, yes, it becomes clickbait. One click, one click, one click. So much time goes in that. So now I've got two, three friends who give me some content which I can comment on. And then when they give me the content, then I read that, analyze that, and I use that. And when I get bored, I like quotes. So I like spiritual quotes, philosophical quotes. And I also try to present the Bhagavad Gita in quotable quotes. There's that book Gita Deli, Gita Deli. So what I do is now, whenever I feel bored, I try to look at some quote. And then, because even if it's some quote written by someone else, I try to do, make it devotional, reword it, make it devotional. Even if I, something, some thought I written down, I try to play around with it. Make it a little shorter, make it a little more punchier. And that I find it absorbs me and it also equips me for my classes. So that response is from devotion to delusion, but from devotion, sorry, from dissatisfaction to delusion, dissatisfaction to discrimination and devotion. So each of us can bring that about. Okay. So I'll make one last point. This is a short point and then we can have some questions. <clears throat> now, in this cycle, from dissatisfaction, we may go to a delusion and degradation, or by discrimination, we may go towards devotion. Now, in this case, uh, is this are these two cycles like they are completely non-intersecting circles, or do they intersect? That means, if I go towards delusion, is it that I cannot go towards devotion? If I go towards degradation, can I not go towards devotion? It's not like that. Is that this cycle, even if I have gone down in the cycle, we can always turn back. No matter how much we have gone down, at any point, we can choose to turn back. Of course, the further we have gone down, the more difficult it is to turn back. Just like the snow pebble is much easier to stop than a snowball. And that snowball is also much easier to stop than a snow boulder. But, even if the snow boulder knocks us over, still we can get up and still we can resume. So in that sense, this cycle, no matter how much we've gone in the past and no matter how much we might go in presently also, but as soon as we realize it, we can stop. Okay, I'm going in this direction. Yato yato nishchalati manas chanchal mastiram tatastato niyam yaitad atman yayvashamayat. Krishna says, wherever and whenever the mind wanders, 
bring it back under the control of the self. So the idea is that the mind will wander, but don't let it. As I say the mind may stray away, don't let it stay away. It'll go off track, but as soon as we realize it, bring it back. As soon as we realize it, and it's never too late. Every day can be a new day for us, and by Krishna's grace. So even if we have gone all the way down, Krishna can lift us up from there. Krishna can lift us up, and Krishna can raise us up, equip us with discrimination, and take us towards devotion. So that opportunity is never lost. In that sense, it's never too late to change course, to change trajectory. It's not in a ultimate sense, in the sense of what kind of. Uh, nature we have developed what kind of habits we have developed or even during a particular instance i've gone to this point i stop so for doing that again we need to consult krishna not the mind i'll conclude with this example i suppose there's a boxing match and in boxing match say this one boxer big blow and this other boxer knocked down is knocked down but not knocked out the boxer can get up and fight again Now to do that, the boxer, whom should the boxer turn to? The boxer, no, on only knockdown, they're discouraged. The boxer should turn to the coach. The coach, come on, get up, no, do this, do this. But if that boxer who has been knocked down turns towards the opponent only and asks, "Can I defeat you?" Never. So the other boxer is knocked him down. The boxer will want to intimidate you, dishearten you, and defeat you. So, if you want, if this boxer wants to fight, you should consult not the other boxer but the coach. So, similarly, sometimes our mind knocks us down. The mind makes us do something which we resolve not to do, and then we ask the mind only, "Will I ever be able to do this?" No, never. The mind says with a with a vicious gleefulness. and then we become disheartened so we never lose till we lose heart we never lose till we lose heart and if we listen to the mind we will lose heart it will make us lose heart but instead of listening to the mind okay this happened no problem let me turn towards krishna krishna says i'm always there with you krishna's love for us is not based on who we are we may be pure we may be impure Krishna's love for us is not based on who we are; it is based on who He is. He is the all-loving Lord, Sarv Surudam Sarva Bhuta Na. He is the well-wisher of all living beings. It's said in the Bhagavad Gita that uh, generally we talk about Krishna as Bhakta Vatsala. Does anyone know what is Bhakta Vatsala? He is the lover of his devotees. But in the Bhagavad Gita, it is said Krishna is also Krupa Na Vatsala. Krupana is very materialistic, self-centered people. Krishna says he is the lover of even them. So Krishna loves all of us, no matter what situation we are in. And if we turn towards him, from wherever we are, he can lift us up. So instead of getting disheartened, just because we are feeling bored, or because we have become deluded, or even if we have become degraded, whatever happens, whether we are at the state of dissatisfied, deluded, or degraded, doesn't matter. From wherever we are, we can turn towards Krishna. Take shelter of Krishna, and He will lift us up. That is the redeeming potency of Krishna. And by focusing on Krishna, we can have hope and strength from wherever we may be. And then we can make our emotions our friends in our spiritual journey. So I'll summarize. I spoke today on the theme of move from dissatisfaction towards devotion, not degradation. So I talked about two cycles. One was dissatisfaction through delusion to degradation. Yeah. So dissatisfied. We all feel dissatisfied, is uncomfortable, discomfort because of loneliness, overwork, stress, anger, exhaustion. So many factors. Uh, then we all have developed certain default responses to deal with it. So it might be some people might be drinking, some people might be smoking, some people might be. overeating some people might be <coughs> just uh, surfing on the net tv binging whatever so now now when we do these things they give us a little high 
but they make us lot of low after that but we forget that low we just remember the high that is a delusion and over a period of time we become degraded because we get hooked to it so addiction is often a pre predictor of criminality so this is a unhealthy cycle and when we go down the cycle it is not so much because of lack of intelligence or lack of uh, will power it is just because of a lack of a healthy response to un uncomfortable feelings i talk about the snowball snow pebble being contemplation the snowball being delusion and the snow boulder being degradation coming down but we start contemplating also because we are feeling uncomfortable with what we are doing so we need a healthy response this what is the second second chain from dissatisfaction to discrimination, discrimination to devotion. devotion sorry thank you so in discrimination i talk about three points first is we need to become comfortable with feeling uncomfortable it's not unnatural or unhealthy second is we see this discomfort as a temporary visitor like a player appealing and we become like umpire who observes it in a un disinterested non uninterested way and we respond to it on merit and third is we make emotion an ally by finding out some good thing not that something is good but also feels good and then we do that that is our uddeepan a spiritual stimulus and that can help us to move from dissatisfaction through devotion to through discrimination to devotion and then lastly i talked that even if you have gone down this track from dissatisfaction to delusion to dissatis to degradation many many times krishna is so powerful and so merciful that he can lift us up his love for us is based not on who we are but on who he is he is not just bhakta vatsala but also krupana vatsala so we never lose heart till we lose we, we never lose till we lose heart so if you are knocked down in the boxing match within us so if consulting the mind consult krishna krishna say come on get up i'll help you and then by krishna's grace you can break this default cycle of dissatisfaction delusion and degradation but instead have that healthy chain of dissatisfaction discrimination and devotion thank you very much hare krishna so any questions or comments yes you had a question all good Okay. <laughs> yes, please. Bro, after we've fallen down so many times, after we've been knocked down by our emotions so many times, etc., how do we maintain the enthusiasm to get back up and fight again? Okay. So if we've fallen down repeatedly, how do we get the enthusiasm to uh, get up? See, change usually doesn't happen. till the cost of staying where we are becomes greater than the cost of changing so what that means is that if somebody has got a particular habit say somebody is alcoholic they drinking hmm? they keep drinking they keep drinking and they don't even realize there is anything wrong with it but sometimes they may they may drink and you know there was this person i was also at a mental health care center and there was this very brilliant person i will like graduate a huh? brilliant person but he was in the mental health care center so what had happened he had gone into drinking and while drinking drinking he was once driving a car with his wife and child and his wife had said don't drive i'll drive no i'm okay he drank too much and he had drunk and he drove and somehow he lost control and his the car broke and he survived but his wife and child died in the car accident in the car crash and then he had what is called as survivor's guilt and that survivor's guilt made him almost like insane so that time he realized what a price i paid for my alcoholism so uh, to uh, in, a, in our inner war we have a inner enemy our unhealthy habit that is inner enemy to understand that this inner enemy is cruel is crucial it's cruel you know it can hurt us it can hurt others what cost it can take we don't know so sometimes we may have to experience that cost ourselves and then we will be jolted out but sometimes we can use our intelligence to understand where we are headed so then we can ourselves assess this is the cost i'll have to pay 
and this is not worth it it's not worth it so uh, it's only when we can assess the cost yes uh, i may feel i can't give this up but when i say i can't give this up now for this i am giving so many things up isn't it mm-hmm. it's just thinking that i can't give this up we focus on what i am giving up for this like there's a beautiful past time of prabhupad when one of his disciples was smoking and prabhupad said do you want to let a cigarette come between you and krishna say a small temporary insignificant pleasure krishna is source of eternal joy so we need to use our intelligence to assess the cost and, and so so if somebody says that oh i can't give this up okay but for this what am i if i am spend a lot of time on net surfing then i was talking with one devotee who who just has this compulsive who has this compulsive net surfing capacity uh, habit so then i talked with him and i said how much time do you spend and then we talked about it and he is i told him that the amount of time you spend on that if you had spent on reading the bhagavatam so you would have completed all 12 cantos of bhagavatam by when you calculated that at a normal reading speed not a super fast reading speed also really my god then it jolted him oh god so much time i wasted so what happens is that mm, temptation buys us on an installment basis <laughs> it doesn't ask for a huge down payment if somebody says that oh you have to pay a million dollars for this i don't want it <laughs> but just pay you know you just pay 1 dollar daily okay 1 dollar is not big deal but maybe over years we end up paying million dollars for something is not worth it so temptation buys us on an installment basis every day it takes little 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 but that little eventually becomes very large so if we use our intelligence to assess, assess the cost the cost what we have to pay for this what we eventually will have to pay for this if things go wrong which they will sooner or later and the cost we are already paying in terms of giving up something that will jolt us out and then once we get the desire to change then krishna is there to help us so instead of saying that oh i can't give this up you feel uh, how much longer will i give krishna up for this just change the question so saying i can't give this up yeah how much more i'll give up krishna for this and that will give us the inspiration to change okay thank you any other questions any comments from oh yeah please yeah uh, just a observation yeah to talk about emotions and uh, intuition hmm uh, it's really Uh, human beings are so uh, controlled by their emotions that they can't change with their intellect and make a better decision. Okay, good Other question. Like if you're tired, the, the rational thing is to rest rather than drinking. Yeah. Why are we drinking instead of just taking a rest? Yeah. So is it that we are so driven by emotions that we can't think properly? Why don't we rest when we are tired instead of drinking? see we all have an emotional side and a rational side now in different people the rational some people the emotional side may be very strong some people the rational side may be very strong mm-hmm. but even in people who know the rational side is very strong sometimes their reason is an is a inspector of emotion this doesn't make sense no need to do it but sometimes reason becomes an instrument of emotion that means that emotion rationalizes emotion uses the reason to rationalize what we are doing so for all of us we come from different backgrounds and based on the kind of conditionings we have from the past something which may seem very easy for us that will be very difficult for someone else say if somebody were just a social drinker hmm that Hey, when I'm with my colleagues, with my friends, I don't want to be the odd person out, so I drink. And that some that person comes to a society or uh, now they develop a friend circle, which is not drinking, and the drinking will go away. See, I just left it so easily. But somebody else might be drinking as a 
स्ट्रेस रिलीफ मैकेनिज्म और एस्केप मैकेनिज्म एंड देन इवन इफ दे कम टू एसोसिएशन गुड एसोसिएशन स्टिल दैट अर्ज फॉर ड्रिंकिंग वाज नॉट बिकॉज ऑफ बैड एसोसिएशन इट इज बिकॉज ऑफ देयर डिजायर टू गेट रिलीफ फ्रॉम स्ट्रेस सो अनलेस दे फाइंड अ हेल्दीयर वे टू गेट रिलीफ फॉर दैट स्ट्रेस दैट क्रेविंग विल कीप ट्रबलिंग देम सो ईच ऑफ अस एवरी अनहेल्दी इमोशन is actually an unhealthy expression of a healthy need is a healthy need the want relief from discomfort is a healthy need but is a unhealthy expression of that so that's why the same activity may require different degrees of will power for different people and some people might be very reasonable and rational in one area of life and other area of life they may just completely slave of their emotions so it just depends on the whole uh, uh, set of conditionings that the person has of course everybody has intelligence and uh, everybody has reasoning capacity and if we can activate the reasoning capacity then they can begin moving towards a solution but uh, generally people who are very rational they just can't understand emotional people why do you do that But, but that's because you know it's almost like the two of them are speaking different languages it's just that now in so imagine uh, i read somewhere but i don't remember the exact words say one language you say hello hmm? but if the word hello in another language means you fool hello fool why are you calling me a fool i said hello again you are calling me a fool so the two per- the person is saying one thing but in the other language it's understood entirely differently so like that when people say somebody is very emotional and they are indulging in something it's actually a call for help it's a need for relief but a, re- a rational person at that time starts making judgment why are you doing this don't be so foolish and then that person feels even more isolated even more lonely even more sorry for oneself so now our emotions are real for us so now the emotions may not be reality may not be based on reality the emotion so that if i am feeling lonely now i may have many friends and actually i may not be lonely i just need to connect with them so my emotion may not be based on fact but for me my emotion is a fact when i am feeling lonely actually i am feeling lonely so we have to acknowledge is person feeling lonely and then address it If you say no, why are you lonely? You have so many friends. Oh, but my friends don't understand me. Whatever it is, so we have to. So for people, their feelings are their facts. Their feelings may not actually reflect facts, but for them, they are facts. And we need to begin by that acknowledgement, and then we help them to see. Okay, you are feeling like this. You are seeing only this fact. But what about this fact? This fact. This fact. This fact. Oh, you know. Okay, I have so many people who care for me. Yeah, I am not alone. Does your question? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Based on this whole uh, culture of entitlement, uh, of whole culture of entitlement. Yes. Needs, uh, counseling, everybody needs to go to this and that and help, and they have safe uh, spaces in universities and schools. I am interested in how things are going. I mean, who can help anybody? I mean, if they are not willing to help themselves. Yeah, that's a big challenge. I think yes, we do live in an age of entitlement, where people feel that they have a right to things, and when they don't get things, they feel outraged by that. So, when they don't, yeah, they don't want to help themselves, then they expect others to help them. Yeah, it's, it's. I think there are two, three factors in this. I talk with a lot of college students. At least when I came from India here, it was a shock for me to see how many. kids american american i i mean america australia i mean more in america how many kids are from single parent families and it's it's very difficult i, I was with one i was talking with one boy he's coming regularly for my programs he said he grew in foster care and i asked him what happened you know did you did your parents die in an accident or something he said no both my parents are alive really he said when i was 5 my parents got separated and when they got separated they both told me that this marriage was the biggest mistake of my life 
and you remind me of that mistake. So both of them said, I, we don't want anything to do with you. And despite having two parents, this boy became a ward of the state. So now he's, he just couldn't process it. All this grown up now, he's in college and studying. But still, people get psychologically damaged. I mean, not damaged in terms of mad, but just that they're not, there's no healthy development. So I feel that's one factor that when the family structure collapses, people who grow up in unsteady families, they have a lot of psychological issues. Another thing is that uh, in the past, uh, uh, say, uh, relationships or marriages, they were seen as an obligation. Of course, everybody wants pleasure, but it's also a duty. And people, if, if I get married to someone, I'll stay with them. Now that obligation, responsibility, duty part is more or less gone. Mm -hmm. And it's all for pleasure. And when it's all for pleasure, it leads to enormous insecurity. It's enormous. One of the biggest fears, I studied, I did a seminar on fear in America. So I studied what top 10 fears of the 18th century, 19th century, 20th century, 21st century. So there are two new fears which have come up in the 21st century. One is the fear of terrorists. And the second is fear of rejection. Perform. If I form a relationship and somebody rejects me and abandons me and goes away. So, because that kind of structure of uh, that commitment in relation is not there, people themselves are very insecure. And often, all the other issues that come up, they come from that insecurity. So, you don't have parental love while you're growing up. And then you don't have uh, uh, the, a steady relationship with a spouse or a partner. You don't have that, then it very, becomes very insecure. And what happens? Even people who have this, who may have good parents, who may have good relationship, but by associating with others who are insecure, they also become insecure. So that's why in colleges and universities, it's the students have seen, they may put on a facade. You know, I'm so young, I'm so attractive, I'm so successful. But they're very insecure inside. So I don't know whether there's an easy solution to it. But at least any solution will begin with understanding. So at one level, it's entitlement mentality. Because what has happened? At a physical level, they have comforts much more than what our generation had. And that's why we feel, oh, what's wrong with you? But physically, they, are, they may be well provided for, but emotionally, often they are quite alienated. And third point is that the world has changed enormously in the last 20, 30 years. In fact, you should say that the change in the last 20 years is more than what has changed has happened in the last 200 years. Mm -hmm. So because of, especially the internet and social media. So what has happened? Every generation has a generation gap with other, the previous generation. But in this case, it's not a generation gap. It's like a generation valley. <laughs> it's like the previous generation and the next generation, they just don't understand each other. So that also makes them feel judged and lonely. So it's a, it's a challenge and I try to counsel teenagers and youth. It's, it's almost like uh, I have to re-educate myself to understand them first. So if I start off trying to educate them, but before I can educate them, I have to re-educate myself. So where are they coming from? What are they thinking? Why do they feel like this? It just doesn't make sense otherwise. So, so it is, um, it is a very, I mean, we are, we find their behavior difficult, but they are also going through difficulties. It's not just that they are creating difficulties for us, they are also themselves distressed and they are seeking some relief. Okay. okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. well, you moved on a bit from what I was going to say. Anyway, yeah. But I was thinking about Shimon Prabhupada, he was the most rational person. He never had any bad habits or did anything sinful in his life. Mm. And he was so spiritually advanced, and yet he was so kind and compassionate to all the other people, you know, from who had kind of habits and everything. So I'm thinking if, if somehow or another we're blessed, we have good intelligence, we don't have bad habits and this kind of thing, then at least we should have compassion for people who aren't so fortunate. If Sean Rafa could do that, then at least we should. Beautiful point, yeah. yeah. No, it's, Prabhupada was so compassionate to everyone. Somehow, 
you know, different devotees take up different things from Prabhupada. So many preachers, they take up the idea, Prabhupada, condemn everyone, fools, rascals, this, that. Mm -hmm. And that's what we often repeat. But if you look at those who interacted with Prabhupada, it was not that uh, like philosophical rigor uh, that, or vigor that attracted them to Prabhupada. That's why Prabhupada's personal love. Prabhupada also says in the Nectar of Instruction that the that the relationship, that the, the Krishna consciousness movement is nourished by the sixfold loving exchanges. So we need to do that. Yes, if we show compassion, show kindness, then it helps people uh, to op to come closer to Krishna. Sometimes, unfortunately, our spirituality, instead of making us more understanding, makes us more judgmental. This is right and this is wrong. Well, we have to have that kind of categorization. We have to have... So, you know, I say that we have to make judgments, but we don't have to be judgmental. We should judge ourselves. Actually. Yeah. Really That's true. That's why, you know, you say like, be like Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasu Thakur with yourself and be like Bhakti Siddhanta Thakur with others. <laughs> <laughs> so, Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasu Thakur was very strict. Bhakti Siddhanta Thakur was very accommodating. <laughs> That's another way of putting it. Thank you. Krishna. Yes, true. Maybe last question. Yeah. Prabhu, so, like how you mentioned the trajectory of uh, uh, dissatisfaction and then uh, you can have the discrimination and when, while, you're in, while you're discriminating, you use your emotional stimuli, right? And I was just thinking in a you know, devotional settings, sometimes that emotional stimuli uh, could it cause us also, I don't know, delusion from discrimination, delusion in a sense that sometimes, you know, we think that we, we can do these things better than anyone else. And in that way, we have the tendency to, you know, do it and then, you know, kind of, you know, make, uh, make, uh, make ourselves think that, okay, I'm, I, I can do it better than any other devotees, just as, just as an example. Okay. That's a good point. So, can our emotions also lead to delusion within devotion if I start thinking I can do this better than others? And now, so there is an objective aspect to it and the subjective aspect to it. The objective aspect is, say, some devotees can speak better than other devotees. Some devotees can sing better than other devotees. Some devotees, they can do management very well. When some devotees do management and others have to manage them. <laughs> 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 so, uh, um, there is an objective fact that not all devotees are equally gifted in all ways. And uh, we need to, in the name of humility, we cannot sacrifice objectivity. That, <coughs> yes, this person is not so good at this. This person is good at this. Sometimes we may say, okay, I am also, uh, you know, I can do this better. If it's, now it's just our own feeling, it could be subjective. But if you talk with some senior devotees, some guides, some friends, and they also say, yes, you have a talent in doing this. Then at, a, at that objective level, if somebody is good at doing some things, it is, it is best that they be engaged in doing that thing. Uh, they will be happy doing it. That thing will also get done well. At a subjective level, it's important that we see our gifts, uh, we see our abilities, uh, we see our talents as our endowments, not our entitlements. That means, yes, these are my talents, but they are not just my talents. They are given to me by Krishna. Paurusham Nirushu. Krishna says, I am ability in people. So, 7.8. So, whatever abilities we have, actually if we see that this is Krishna who has given me this ability, then even having that ability can create humility. Once I was uh, in India, there was a senior devotee who was giving class in English and I was translating into Hindi. And some question, some devotee asked a question. So normally they speak one or two sentences and I would translate it to Hindi. Now some devotee asked a question and this devotee speaker, he forgot that it was supposed to translate it. And he spoke for 15 minutes in answer. And after the answer got over, then he looked at me and everybody started laughing. <laughs> but somehow Krishna has gifted me a good memory. And I, I translated for almost 15 minutes. <laughs> and then everybody clapped over there. Then many devotees came up, how do you remember the whole answer? 
and then now now i had been trained that you know some 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 devotee says if they would say oh you you are so you have got such a good memory so i would just say mechanically it's krishna's mercy so then there was one senior devotee was there for the class and i he said you know it's amazing he said it's amazing you translated the whole answer it's krishna's mercy and then look at me and he said if you remember that it is krishna's mercy then that is krishna's greater mercy <laughs> so to have our abilities is good to remember that our ability is a gift from krishna that is much much better so that subjectively we we can prevent ability from stealing our humility by remembering that the ability is a gift and if some devotee is doing some service we don't have to push them aside and do that service ourselves but in a graceful way we can tell you know that maybe i can do you can do that better so if it makes us egoistic if it makes us insensitive then it becomes a problem there was one devotee in india who was very good at music and then he he was already very good at music and he said i want to learn traditional bengali music so he took he was very desirous of that so his spiritual master gave, gave him permission he went to bengal and 2 3 years he studied how narottam das thakur would do bhajans and learn from the traditional kavadiya vishnavas and he came back brilliant but then in the temple when any program would be there anybody would be singing could find faults you know you're not playing this properly you're not singing this properly you're not singing this properly and eventually he told the temple leaders nobody in this temple knows how to sing so henceforth all kirtans i will do <laughs> and then the temple leader said that actually here we are not singers we are devotees singing for krishna so everybody has singing ability whatever they have they will sing and then they encourage him you make your own kirtan group and you make specialized performances and then he started doing that and he's happy now so he needed his space to have his expert kirtan and his kirtan i have in there that kirtan is not a participation that kirtan is a performance yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he will sing in such a tune that nobody can follow that tune <laughs> wow you can get impressed what a tune he is singing <laughs> so it's so nice to have such talented devotees in our community but so if our ability doesn't still our humility then that emotion won't take us away from krishna okay so thank you very much shila prabhu pad ki gaur bhakt vrind ki da gaur premanande